Okay. Here we go. All righty. Okay. Well, thanks, Susan, Deborah. Thanks for inviting me back. Um, I have been involved with the Rhodes Scholar uh, program for about 20 years now. There's a, a birding trip that, or a birding program that occurs um, at, uh, on the Bass Islands, which are in Lake Erie, just uh, east of where you all will be going into the McGee Marsh area. And we have it during spring migration. Uh, it's, if you're, if you like Road Scholar programs and you want to look that up, uh, it's called Lake Erie, Birding the Islands and Shores. Um, like I said, it's been going on for about 25 years now. Um, and we we have a fellow that helps us. He's a bird bander and he always would give midweek, he would give the warbler talk. And last year he said, I'm tired of giving this talk. Somebody else needs to talk, to give it over. So. That's, that's what I'm giving to you tonight. I, I assembled this talk last year for our participants. I'll be giving it again this spring when I'm helping with the, with the Road Scholar program uh, up in Ohio. Now, let me give you a little bit of information why McGee Marsh is so good in the spring. Um, this is the western area of Lake Erie that's called the Western Basin. It's west of Cleveland, east of Toledo. It's um, a beach ridge habitat, uh, marsh, lots of marsh. It has not been developed. It's been preserved. There's a couple of uh, national wildlife refuges there that are preserved. There's a lot of state land that's preserved. And there's some uh, county, the Lucas County, which is uh, Toledo. There are several metro parks. There are county parks that are preserved that are all working at preserving this uh, marsh area for, uh, because of, of the, um, the, the uh, life that is there, the natural, natural life. The birds come this way, uh, all the songbirds that are going up to breed in the north, in the, in the Canadian northern areas, come to Lake Erie and they stop. They don't fly over the lake at, not, at during the day because there are raptors out. So they come down, they land in these marshes and there's lots of insects. There's lots of natural food. The lake is actually fairly clean uh, based, compared to years past. We've had a couple of rare, not rare, uh, non-native mussels that have helped clean the lake they they don't do very good on intake valves. They 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 do lots of bad damage for for us as humans. But they cleaned up have cleaned up the lake, so the insects that have um, an aquatic stage all tend to emerge in the spring, right when these birds are showing up. So it's a very important stopover spot for all the migrating birds that are going north. It's actually considered a globally important bird area by the National Wildlife or by the Nat National Audubon Society. So why is uh, why is McGee important? That's there's your reason. Um, so we're going to talk about warblers um, that come to this area. Actually, I'm going to touch about 40 different species plus one. These are all species that have been recorded in Ohio um, in years past, and they will all be documented in my talk by pictures and or banding specimens that have been banded. Three of them have different rate, have three, three of these species have multiple races and two of them have hybrids, two or two of them are hybrids. So we'll get to that when we are there. So first, what's a warbler? Well, you have to deal with the, what's the jizz, the general impression, size and shape. They're small, they're active, they're colorful. Uh, we would call them the butterflies of the bird world. The males are, are most of them are just as, as colorful and bright as can be. 
they're like I said, they're small, they're they're um, uh, active. They they feed in all levels of uh, the canopy. They're along the the trunks. They're on the ground. They're they're all over. Um, you determine if there are wing bars. Some have wing bars. Some do not. Some have rump colors. Some have under tail covert colors. You're just looking for small active birds with specific field marks. Are they bobbing their tails? There are several that bob their tails um, and their songs. Some of them have pretty distinct calls. Some of them do not. Uh, anything that helps with songs, like these little assists. Here's the, the first top left is the yellow warbler. Sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. The next one, the black-throated blue warbler, I'm so lazy, and on and on and on. You can, I found this little assist on Google, just Google fun bird cartoons, comics, singing. There's there's several of these out there, and, and the ones that make sense, they're right there. So anything that helps in learning the, the warblers, go for it. So, there's a, a bird observatory at outside of McGee Marsh called Black Swamp Bird Observatory. They have been banding birds um, in this area for over 35 years. And they have determined based on what species they're banding when that spring migration occurs in three distinct waves. Now, there's overlap. That's It's not a set in stone kind of thing. But the first wave is generally mid to late April to early May. Then the second wave is the first two weeks of May. The third wave is towards the end of May. Again, there's overlap. We see the males come first, the females will bring up, they may be in a different wave. But I've, I've arranged my talk based on these three waves. And then I've thrown in what's considered overflight species, southern species that may nest and, and uh, breed in southern Ohio, but occasionally they get off course and they show up at McGee and a few other oddballs that, that we'll talk about as well. So this will occur, This your trip will uh, appear in the second wave almost the third wave, but you could get, you could get some, you know, every year is slightly different. The chances of seeing these birds. So ABA, the American Birding Association has developed codes based on how uh, possible it is you'll see something in a given location. Code one and two are considered regularly occurring, but with range limits. Here we have very likely or possible. Three is considered rare, four is considered casual, five is considered accidental. 50-50 chance for a number three, yeah, four is probably unlikely, and if you see one of the number fives, buy your lottery ticket, yes. So let's talk about the number, for, the number one, the first wave species. I actually saw this one today. These pine warbler, Susan mentioned this, nice big, one of the big warblers. Uh, they prefer pine trees. They come through Ohio first. So when you're here in May, they're probably all gone. We might have a straggler female or a straggler juvenile, but, but the, the bulk of the pine warblers will already be gone. Very large early migrant. Uh, winters almost entirely in the, in the U.S., the southeast area down here. I'm currently in Florida, so I am, am uh, referring to Florida now. Um, prefers to forage in pine trees and it has a really dry trill type call. They show up in Ohio about the same, right, well, we have uh, juncos in the, in the wintertime, so you have to determine which trill you're hearing. Are you hearing junco trill or are you hearing pine warbler trill? This one is down here right now. Yes, here's your palm warbler. 
This one actually has two uh, distinct races. There's the Western race, which is the most common. That's the one that's pictured here. Uh, that's most common in the Mideast. And the yellow race, where most of the underbody is all yellow. That's the East Coast race. But we, in Florida, I've seen them here. I rarely see those up in Ohio. They, they show up, but by and large, the, the Western race is the one that we're more apt to see. Major tail bobber. Oh my gosh, you, you just have to see this bird from a profile bobbing its tail and you know what it is. Uh, there are actually three warblers that are tail bobbers and this is one of them. Um, very common widespread nester in the northern boreal forests, uh, sphagnum bogs. Um, I heard this calling singing on territory last summer and I didn't know what it was because down here it's just doing its very loud chip note and the I had, to, I had to use Merlin and Merlin said, that's a palm warbler singing. So um, a very common bird for you all right now down here in, in, the, in the Southeast. All right. Susan also mentioned the yellow rumped warbler in Ohio or in the, in the US, we primarily get the two races. These were separate up until about the mid seventies. We had the Myrtle warbler in the East and the Audubon warbler, Audubon's warbler in the West. This is a male, uh, has that nice white throat, a uh, distinct pattern around its eye, black and a broken white ring there. Little white or little yellow spot on its cap and uh, on its um, shoulder area and, uh, and yes, the yellow rump. Um, let's see. They nest in the northern coniferous forests, so they're moving their way through when they come to Ohio. Um, here's the female. She is still has that nice yellow throat, a little bit of a, a, a light yellow on the on the on its head and shoulder, but just not not as bright as the as the male. Uh, Susan had pictures of the winter. Here's your winter. It's very dull. It has it just has that hint of the yellow on its shoulder, but it's now doing all that chip note uh, call. And as she said, it primarily winters in the southeast the U of the U.S. Um, it does winter. A few of them will winter in Ohio. We don't have the the waxy bayberries. Those are up in the New England states, but it will eat poison ivy berries in Ohio. So if there's a good reason to leave your, let your poison ivy grow, it's to feed the yellow rump warblers. The black and white warbler is the next one. I've seen a few down here this winter. This is a male, all black and white. The female is a little lighter colored, a little less dramatic than this one. They have a very unique foraging habitat. They, they feed like a nuthatch. They feed up and down the bark on, on branches and trunks and looking for the, the bugs that are hiding in the bark. Um, it has a fun little call. It's kind of like a squeaky wheel, squeaky, 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 just up and down and up and down. And that's a, a cool thing to, to listen for. They nest on the ground. Um, and they nest in deciduous forests. So they nest in, they will come up and, and nest in Ohio. They're not going all the way up into the coniferous forests. Uh, next one is black-throated green. This is the male, nice thick black bib, uh, olive colored back, yellow, that yellow face pattern, uh, wing bars, um, very, very cool bird. Uh, this one is on its way north into the coniferous forests. Uh, feeds along the tree edges, but you'll see these. The female does not have, it has more of a muted throat uh, than the male does, but beautiful little bird, beautiful little bird. So now let's talk about the second wave. So I was trying to find clip art for my 
transfers, and this is as close as I could find for, for number two. Um, these species that will follow are in the general order based on BSBOs, the Black Swamp Bird Observatory's banding data. They have established a range as to when you could find them, and I just kind of put them in order based on their, on their data. So the first one, the cerulean. This would be a little bit of a tough one to find. That's why it's noted as being a number four. They nest in mature deciduous forests. So northeast, northwest Ohio is about on their the fringe of how far north they would come. I've seen them in, in Canada at Point Pelee, but this is more of a deep forest nester. Um, and it nests high up in the trees and it sings from high up in the trees, but it starts singing when the trees are all leafed out. So it's tough to find. Uh, it's a highly sought after, beautiful cerulean blue. It's got a pure white belly with that uh, necklace collar that the, the male shows. Um, just a, a lovely bird, lovely one. I, I hope you see one. How's that? Orange crown warbler. Susan mentioned that. There's a few of those down here that you're apt to see. They're a little less common in the east. They're more common in um, the southwest, the Texas area. They're, they're all over the place. Though they breed in, they breed in Canada, so they, they're on their way through. Um, but they forage down low in shrubs and low brush, and you're, you're not breaking your neck trying to find them. Um, they're very drab looking. You rarely see the orange crown. It's there, but it's, it's not very often seen. I think the picture on the right, you can just get a hint at it. That's only because Tom, our bander, had the bird in hand and could manipulate the bird so you could you could see that that orange crown. Nashville warbler. These are very common uh, migrants through the through McGee. They breed in the north in the in the northern again coniferous bog areas. Um, they nest on the ground up there. Second growth brushy habitat. Uh, they have that prominent white eye ring, gray cap, yellow throat and belly, olive colored back. And they have, a, the males have a little bit of a, a rusty cap as well, if you can see that when, when you've got one in hand. Um, a few years ago on the boardwalk at McGee, they were all over the place and you almost got tired of seeing them. I, I, I hate to say that, but all right. Blue winged warbler, lovely call. Bee buzz, bee buzz. They perch up high in the trees and, and do their two parted call. They're ground nesters, deciduous forests, so they nest in Ohio. Uh, they don't they they don't go far up into the into the pine into the pines. But beautiful little bird, uh, yellowish body that distinct black line through their eye and the bluish-ish back, a little bit of a, a wing bar-ish. Um, anyway, beautiful bird. Closely related is the golden wing warbler. This one is another highly sought after. And we, we saw a couple of these last year uh, up at McGee. So they do come through. They are... Um, they also have a lovely call, bee buzz buzz, bee buzz buzz. I was on the boardwalk last year and I heard the call and I stopped in my tracks and said, oh my gosh, there's a golden wing warbler somewhere. And the girl in front of me said, oh, I'm so sorry. I just played the call for my boyfriend. And it was like, ah, don't do that. Makes everybody get excited. Uh, it's a ground nester. Um, they prefer second growth woodlands. They, they have a, an area that, you know, they, they nest up in the Northeast, but then they come down along the Appalachian mountains and nest there. 
They're becoming rarer though, because the blue wing warblers are uh, out competing them and moving, pushing out, pushing them out. Um, this is, a, the ABA has chosen this bird as the 2024 bird of the year, trying to bring attention to its, its uh, plight of sorts that its numbers are declining because of blue wing warblers. This blue wing and golden wing also hybridize. In 2010, we found our Road Scholar group found a Brewster's warbler on the, on the, at the entrance to the boardwalk. The Brewster's, there's, this is the, one of the few hybridizations where they've actually named the species, which is pretty unique. Um, and as I was getting ready for my talk, I just discovered that the Brewsters is actually considered a first generation hybrid. This is the result. Brewsters is a result of a blue wing, golden wing cross. Now to make that different from the Lawrence's warbler, which is also a hybrid. The Lawrence's is a Brewsters hybridizing with either a blue wing or a golden wing. I've not seen uh, the Lawrence's, but I know they do show up. People find them. Again, if you find one, buy your lottery ticket. These are called back crosses where they, uh, the hybrid is a back cross from a hybrid and a purebred. And, uh, see if you can find one. All right. Northern water thrush. They are very loud singers. They're difficult to find. Uh, they nest in the Northern Ohio deciduous forests, but they're like a ventriloquist. They can call and you cannot find them because it sounds like it's coming from all around. They prefer uh, to be near water, standing water, bogs, swamps, um, nothing moving. They tend to be seen down on the ground. And this is a mat, another tail bobber or the whole rear end bobs. Um, and they kind of sachet and they, yeah, they're very, they're very cool to find, to find and watch. They're not very bright and colorful, but um, they're uh, a, a neat bird to find. Now, yellow warbler, most widespread warbler in the US. This is the male, yellow, a little bit of black on the wings and those bright yellow or bright red streaks down its breast. Female does not have those stripes. Uh, it's all yellow with a big black eye. That's important too. These nest at McGee, so they will be all over the place. Males, females, they'll be chasing each other. They will be singing their hearts out. Sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. You will see lots of these. There are two separate races that we see occasionally in Ohio. This is the Eastern race, the most predominant. And occasionally in fall migration, we will see one of the Northwest or Alaskan race yellow warblers. They're much more, they're much duller in color, uh, but that's a fall, a fall thing. Chestnut sided. This is the male, nice pretty yellow cap, uh, black and white eye face pattern. Um, that nice little ch chestnut streak down the side. This is one of the few warblers that benefits from human habitat changes. It likes to nest in the brushy areas along farm edges and, and edge, edge habitat. Um, it has a somewhat of a distinct song that we've put words to. Please, please, please to meet you. And that's the male. The female is not quite as, is a little more subtle as most, most of the warbler females. One of my favorites, this is the prothonotary warbler. Uh, it's nearly always found near water. Um, it actually nests in cavities. This is the only warbler in the east, 
eastern warbler to do that. Uh, some of the parks up here will take empty Metamucil jars and put holes in them and put them out in the swamps and the birds will nest in those. Pretty cool. Has a very loud one note, one pitch call and it's a very emphatic um, call. Flares its tail. You can see the one in hand there has the, the white patterns on its tail, but very distinct. And you're pretty much every year we'll get them at McGee. I believe they even nest over at Maumee Bay State Park, which is one of the marshes, one of the marsh areas, protected areas up there. The Blackburnian, commonly or lovingly called the fire throat. That nickname was uh, penned by Roger Tory Peterson. This one is passing through. Uh, it's, it's on its way to the northern conifer trees as well. It sings from the treetops. Just a beautiful bird. Everybody is excited to see them because of that bright yellow orange. The one on the left even shows more orange than the one on the right. Females are little, are quite a bit more subdued. Beautiful though. Magnolia warblers. These are all pictures of males. Well, why not? They're, they're lovely. Pretty gray cap, very uh, distinct white and black eye pattern, yellow throat, has this necklace with, with uh, streaking down its breast. Um, another year on the boardwalk many years ago, that's all we saw. And that was pretty excited. We call them Maggie's when you're up north. Magnolia warblers, beautiful. What's next? The oven bird. The oven bird is, uh, I think friends around here have started to see them. They breed in dry leafy woodlands. So they, they breed in Ohio. Um, you'll hear them singing. They build, they're actually, they actually build a nest on the ground, an oven shaped nest, and they like to walk on the ground. So you'll see them, un unless they're singing from territory and then they'll be up in a tree perhaps, but you'll see them foraging on the ground, just walking around. Their song is a rendition of teacher, 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 or teacher, 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 very loud, very, very emphatic. For a, for a lovely little bird. Kind of looks like a thrush, but with a head pattern. The Northern Perula. Um, yes, us Northerners think these are pretty cool. They are the most adaptable and wide ranging nester in the warblers. They nest from the Canadian spruce forests all the way down to the Florida swamps. They build nests in hanging Spanish moss down here or northern lichens up in the north. Their song is an upward trill with a very abrupt end. Zzzz, just very abrupt at the end. And uh, the males are, are the ones that do the singing. This is a male, beautiful slate gray color with a bright yellow throat, yellow chest with that um, collar. It sometimes has a little bit of a red, reddish, orangish in that yellow uh, chest area and the olive colored back patch. Beautiful little bird. Black throated blue. This is one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites, but this is the male. Very pretty black, dark, all black throat stripes on the side. Uh, nice blue on the top. Um, this one, the, they nest in the understory and mixed woodlands. So they will nest in, in uh, Northern Ohio as well. Song is, I'm so lazy. I'm bzz, 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 bzz. You just kind of hear it's a slow slurry kind of call. This warbler has the most difference between the sexes. Now you look at the male on the left, there's a little white patch on the wing, the sides of the wing. Let's take a look at the female. That's your female. 
completely different from the male, but that little white patch on the wing there on the side, we call that the handkerchief. And that's important because there's not a whole lot. She does have a bit of an eye line, um, curved eye line, uh, buffy colored, just olive colored on the back. Not, not too much to stand out, but you have to remember that little handkerchief patch. Um, this species of warbler has the, the most profound difference between the males and the females in plumage. Cape May warbler. This is a nice male, uh, yellow, olive colored, big wing bar, orange cheek patch or, or rusty cheek patch, uh, dark head, dark cap and streaks on its, on its breast. Well, you'll see a lot of those in, at McGee. They breed in the Northern coniferous forest. So they're on their way through nesting in the treetops. Um, Nice male. Common yellow throat. Those are down here right now. These are very widespread and very common. They nest near the ground in dense marsh habitat. So if you are out in the marsh and you hear this song, witchity, 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 witch, that's your common yellow throat. This is the male, has that nice black mask, white stripe on the top and a yellow throat. The female has that nice yellow throat, but not the mask. So you've got, here's a picture of the male on the left and the female on the right. Still that olive, both of them have that kind of olivey, yellowy, dull color on the back, but look for that, that yellow throat for the female. Very common. In, in our areas during the summer. And, and they're, like I said, they're down here now. Tennessee warbler. This is an interesting one. Uh, again, another one that's migrating through Northern coniferous forests. They nest along the edge of swamps and bogs. They have a very loud call and it's, or song, and it's a multi-parted song. So you'll hear it go from one bit to another, to another, maybe two or three different segments of its call and they're tough to find because they're little they're warblers they're up there unless they start moving i kind of th think it res resembles a philadelphia vireo to a point only smaller uh gray cap white under throat all the way under belly and the olive olive color on the back Cool little bird, but, and, and loud singer, just sometimes tough to find. Black pole, this is one of my favorites. Um, this is the male, has a black cap, um, white breast with some streaking there on the sides, black and white. It has a completely different winter or fall um, plumage. Um, it's, a huge has a huge nesting range from Alaska to Newfoundland uh, in the and it nests in the top of the conifer trees. It winters in Brazil, down in the Amazon, flying over 3,000 miles between breeding and wintering habitat. The longest songbird migration on record, songbirds. Um, you want to note that it has yellow feet. That's important, mainly in the fall, but it has a distinct call. It's a t -t 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 -t. just not no tone to it, but it's a just a cool, distinct call. The female looks different. Uh, note the feet, they're yellow. This is what kind of what the male looks like in the fall. So it loses that black cap. It's just the gray, the greeny gray black streaks back and a little bit of streaking on the side, but you have to notice the feet color because there's another bird that is looks a lot like this in the fall, but it has a different color feet. So the feet 
color is important when you're making the, that distinguish. Okay, here we're gonna go do third wave species. I couldn't find a three, so we're just waving on this one. And the bird that I wanted to, I'd like to compare to the black pole is the bay-breasted. This uh, handsome guy, this is the male, black cat or bay-colored cap, bay-colored breast, with it continuing down the sides as it kind of lightens up. That black and gray striping on the back um, is it loses a whole lot of this coloring in the fall. And note the foot color, black. It has black, dark legs. So if you see a couple of birds that look like you're not quite sure what they are, have that streaking on the back, look at the foot color. These nest in the Northern Coniferous Forest as well. They're a mid-level forager. They're not as quick as a lot of the warblers. It's a pretty large warbler. And it's, uh, like I said, it forages a little slower than the other. Uh, similar fall plumage with the black poles, only the feet. And the females look a lot like the female black, uh, the female black pole, but has black feet. American Redstart. This is one of the most abundant and widespread songbirds in the Northern Hemisphere. They consider it a model of species for observation because it's easy to find. They're vocal, they're, uh, they, they nest in open woodlands, they're not way up in the treetops, they sing a lot. Um, the male is sings a lot and they're, they're just easy to find. They're, black with the uh, orange and white and they're just a very um, good bird for studying because of that. Um, the male is the only one that sings, the female does not. Now the first year males look just like the females so they don't start to get their their adult plumage until into their second year. So if you see a female that seems to be singing it's, a, it's the uh, male that hasn't changed into its adult plumage yet. The female looks like this, gray head, white belly, yellow, orange, kind of yellowish shoulders. It has uh, yellow uh, on either side of its tail and on its wings. And these um, red starts are interesting in how they forage, they'll flip their tails and their wings, flashing them essentially to try to uh, flush the insects and then they chase after the bugs. So it's easy to see them in the, in the uh, forest when they're, when they're doing that. They also like to display to each other and they'll flash their wings and they're, they're just very fun to watch. The Canada warbler. Um, this one always gets a lot of attention on the boardwalk. They come through, but they're they're not as as uh, flashy as some of the other ones. Um, they nest in den dense, moist undergrowth. Gray, solid gray on the back, white eye ring, uh, black on the face, and that necklace. Not as long as the mag magnolia, but a little shorter necklace. Just a beautiful bird. Um, they're an active forager and they will chase their prey instead of just biting it off the tree. They'll chase after insects and things. But it's a it's one that everyone likes to see if they can if they can find it. Uh, this is one that Susan mentioned as well, the Wilson's warbler, another northern nester, primarily around bogs. Uh, its feeding habit habitat is similar to flycatchers, so it will also chase after. This is the male with a little black cap. Female does not have that. She has a darker area, but it's just not quite as black as the male. No other, you know, there's no wing bars. It's a, it's a olive colored uh, bird on the back and yellow in the front. 
the morning warbler is one that lots of people like to see. Why? Because it's a skulker. A skulker is a bird that's secretive and it's down low and it hides. It likes to be in thick brush and it doesn't stand up pretty and sing unless it's on territory. We were in Michigan last year and one popped up because it was a nice male singing on territory. They uh, like brushy habitat, uh, like along edges of clear cuts and forests so they can sit, stand up and, and defend their, their habitat or their territory. Now, coming through McGee, they're feeding, they're not singing, they're down low. Um, one year I was there with a friend and we actually saw several, which was not, not the normal, but they're uh, a beautiful one to see. The major skulker, what I would call the major skulker. This is the Connecticut warbler. This one has a set time period that's pretty, pretty accurate for when they find it coming through Ohio. That's April 20 or May 20th through the 27th. That's the week that you wanna go out looking for Connecticut warblers. That's also, you're, you're well into tree leaf out where you can't see much unless it comes down and it's right in your face. Um, it took me a long time to find one of these for my life bird. Uh, 2022, in fact, two years ago, and I found it on May 24th. So it was right in that time period. It's got a very loud song, but it's hard to find. It's, it's like one of those ventriloquists, like the, like the, uh, Northern water thrush trying to find it. It's also, lots of leaves are out. They nest in the North, in the, the Northern bogs, muskeg bogs, tamarack, black spruce habitat, where there's lots of bugs. I've been told that I should go, I was told that I should go up and find it singing on habitat, but to get to the habitat is either impossible or you've covered in a bug net because it's just a very buggy area. Very large warbler. They also come through in the fall. This was one that we banded at the, our Road Scholar does a program in the fall as well, looking at the fall migrants. So this one we banded in 2022, has that nice big eye ring. Just, we had two or three that day, which was just unheard of and that I thought anyway. Um, so let's talk about over, overflight species. These are some of the Southern nesters that just either get off course or the storm brings it in or a nice South wind and they just land, they just show up and everybody gets excited. Louisiana water thrush. These actually nest in Southern Ohio, uh, but, but they're less common up North because of, of uh, habitat that they prefer. Another tail bobber or rear end bobble, bobber. They uh, are on the ground. They walk, they're ground walkers. They actually like water, but they prefer running water as opposed to the Northern water thrush that likes boggy standing water. They build their nest near the water. And in addition to insects, they also eat crustaceans that they get out of the, out of this water. Um, Worm-eating warbler, another one that breeds in Southern Ohio, but is an overshoot type of bird that shows up in, in uh, occasionally in Northern Ohio. Non, not a very colorful guy, um, olive colored back, buffy colored body, but it's got those, it's got three or four racing stripes down its, uh, down its, uh, over its head. One through each eye and two down the top of its head. Pretty good size bill. Um, and it has a trill song that sounds like a bug. I won't do that one. But that's how you listen for it. You hear that trill and then you go looking for it. Prairie warbler. This is another one that Susan mentioned. This is more of a Southern Ohio species. Uh, it's a tail bobber. Um, it likes to 
uh, perch up high and sing. It likes clear cut areas where it can be perched and it will nest in the shrubby habitat around, you know, that a uh, clear cut that has been growing back. Uh, you'll find these uh, up perched or you'll hear them. They're tough to find because of, of blending in with all the leaves and things, but um, has kind of an upward trill when it's singing prairie. Um, another one that, that you see here in Florida that Susan mentioned, the yellow-throated warbler. This is another more southern deciduous forest. We do have them nesting over in along the Cuyahoga River in uh, Cleveland area, Cuyahoga National Park. You can find them. They really like sycamore trees. So you want to watch if you're down, if you're in northern Ohio and you want to look for these, check uh, check the sycamore trees and see what's feeding up in those. My on a, on a side note, my dad lives in Southern Ohio and he gets them at his feeder. I'm not quite sure why, what they're coming for, but they, they show up, they don't stay very long, but they'll show up and we get really excited when we see them. Um, another overshoot, the Kentucky warbler, beautiful bird, olive colored, yellow underneath, that nice black facial pattern. This is a bit of a skulker. It's a deep woods, uh, deep woodland nester. Has kind of a galloping call. Um, we actually had one last summer that a male that was at uh, one of the metro parks on the west side of, Cle of Toledo called Oak Openings. And it was there all summer calling, uh, trying to find its a mate, but it was, way out of range. Hooded warblers actually nest throughout most of Ohio and the, and the, the eastern part of the U.S. Deep Woodlands um, has a pretty distinct call, weed a weed a weed -o, weed -a weed -a weed -a This is the, black, the male with the black hood, um, olive colored back, yellow front, that eye mask kind of thing. Female, it has a little bit of a hood, but not nothing like the male. We'll see those, that's the number three, we'll see those in, in uh, Maumee Bay, McGee area, um, more often than some of these others. All right, now, these are the ones that you wanna play the lottery on. Kirtland's Warbler. Actually, we, have been seeing these more often than we used to. Uh, this is one of the rarest warblers in the US or in the, in the world. Uh, it was considered an endangered species. It was on the endangered list from 1967 to 2019. There are currently about 4,500 individuals um, that they've, uh, accounted for or that they've, they've uh, kept track of. And why was this, why is it so rare? Well, it has really extreme and specific nesting habitat requirements. It nests in dense stands of young jack pine, uh, shrubby, uh, uh, scrubby short-lived conifer that thrives in sterile sandy soils. The tree is a fire specialist, so it needs fire to open its, its cones to disperse its, its seeds. Um, so think about the late 60s, Smokey the Bear was here. Oh, forest fires are bad. So they tried to stop all this fires. And because of that, the trees got too big. The fire didn't control their sizes or, or their the, the shrubby brush underneath them. And because of fire suppression and also brown-headed cowbirds, if you know what a brown-headed cowbird is, they nest in other birds' nests. They parasitize the nest. The other bird will then raise their young and kick out the, the native birds and hurt the population. 
So both of those factors took a toll on the Kirtland's warbler. It's a ground nester, uh, nests uh, in uh, among lichen and blueberries growing beneath these young pines. And another field characteristic of this bird, it's a tail bobber. So let me show you one little diagram. Um, there's a really good book out by Scott Widensall. Uh, if you've heard of Scott, he's delightful young, a, a, a delightful man. Uh, and the book came out in 2021, A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds. And he has a whole chapter on Kirtland's warblers. I, I uh, saw him last year and chatted with him a bit and asked him if I could use this diagram because it was, it, it's just perfect. And so he sent me the JPEG and said, use it, no problem. So why are the Kirtland's warblers so rare? Well, they nest in a pretty small area in upper lower Michigan, that, that core breeding range there in the middle. They winter in an even smaller area in the Bahamas. So uh, already you're losing, you know, you don't have a lot of space to work from. Um, so the what's happened is that the state and federal forest agencies that, that manage uh, land in, in the Michigan, upper Michigan there, they have started managing these jack pines, uh, about 150,000 acres of, of forest that they, that they manage. And every year about 4,000 of those acres of mature jack pines are clear cut. They then replant uh, five to seven million seedlings leaving small grassy openings about every 30 or 40 yards in all directions and a few dead scattered snags for perching plus a few pin oaks interspersed. So the, the process is amazing. The ideal plot for a Kirtland's warbler for breeding is six to 12 foot tall trees, six, five to six feet apart, pretty specific. So they repeat this every year. Um, they let their plots grow for about 15 years and then they'll clear cut them and replant and they do this over this whole area and they've made a remarkable uh, effect on the success of the Kirtlands. They've also controlled the cowbird predation. And if you want to see Kirtlands warblers, if you don't see them out on McGee, uh, you visit an area in Michigan called Mayo, Michigan, and they, you can get a tour there to take you out to the breeding, breeding areas. I think there's also a small population that is successfully breeding in, in Wisconsin as well. So nice success story on these Kirtland's warblers. Uh, the least common of the Eastern wood warblers is the Swainson's warbler. I go to Kentucky to see this because it's rarely if ever comes into Ohio. It's very secretive, very subtle, coloring browns and tans, as you see in the picture, uh, nests in deciduous forests, preferring dense undergrowth foliage. It likes rhododendron tangle the areas. Um, and again, you find it when it's singing on territory. Uh, there are a few records for Ohio. Five have been accepted since 91. The most recent was in May of 2021, but I wouldn't count on that. Now we have a few Western species that show up um, in Ohio and or on the boardwalk. Uh, the black-throated gray warbler. This is a, like I said, a West Southwestern species. We've had at least 12 records in Ohio. Nine have been accepted since 1991, including two individuals that I saw or that were, that were seen on the boardwalk in 2018. And I, I saw one of those, which was pretty cool. Incidentally, um, right before Christmas this past year, for about three weeks, we had one in Cleveland. Go figure. It was over in the, in the Euclid Beach area, and it was there for just about exactly three weeks. Another west-southwestern species, the Townsend's warbler. 
Uh, the first record was in Ohio was from 1973. This bird that you see here pictured was, showed up at McGee last year for about two days. And a friend of mine, well, it was late April last year, uh, photographer friend of mine from Toledo was fortunate enough to, to snap that picture. Another Southwestern species, uh, the painted red start. The only record we have in Ohio was from Cuyahoga County, which is Cleveland, from November of 1970. So don't, don't hold your breath on that one. All right, I've got one more to mention. Um, I've got a thumbs down on this one because it's really no longer a warbler. And, but it's still listed with the warblers in your book. The yellow-breasted chat. I, they lumped it with the warblers because uh, I don't think they knew what to do with it. It's much larger than a warbler. It's got that nice yellow uh, throat, upper chest, gray cap, big bill. Um, in 2017, the, the American Ornithological Society decided to split the chat from the warbler family. It's now a single species in its own family, the Ictiterae family, which is closer to the blackbirds. Uh, it performs this crazy courtship display and it sings a whole variety of, of sounds and calls and things. You, you get it down here. I know I've seen it over at uh, Oakland Nature Preserve. But if you have a, an old field guide, it's still listed with the warblers. So that's why I've got it here. Okay, we are gonna do a quick little quiz and you can do this by um, putting your answers in the chat box. Susan, if you wanna re- uh, sure. Unmute yourself, there you go. Let's do a couple, of, let's do a few quiz birds. So. This first one, tell me sex and species or species and sex. See what we get. All right. All right. We have male yellow rump to warbler from- Yay, ding, 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 ding. And Deborah Green, yay. Very good. All right, the next one. Species and sex. All right, guys, you know this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing something looks like it's tucked in a pocket there. I, a female. Yeah, I see something yeah. that looks like something tucked in a pocket. Yes. Black throat of blue female. Yay. Very good. Yay. Next one. All right. Cape May female. Cape May male. So it yep. is a male. That's a male. Yeah. Cape May. All right. This is the tricky one. American Red Start female. It's American Red Start, but look at that black that's coming out around its eyes and its neck. It's bib. This is a second year male that's starting to molt. This is the trick. That's why I said this that is, is a tricky one. That's pretty this good. Is the, this one would be singing. And you would say, why is that female singing? But no, look at it's got some black coming out. It looks like a female until it's not. All right, last one. Black and white, so we just need male or female. Female, black Excellent. and white, female. Excellent, well done, you all pass. <laughs> all right, so I need to acknowledge, thank you very much, and I need to acknowledge the, the uh, photos. Most of them came from, or a lot of them came from Brian Zwiebel, who's a professional photographer. Tom and Paula Bartlett are the, the bird banders. 
my friend Rick from Toledo, my friend Debbie from, from uh, um, oh, Chardon, and a couple of pictures from me. So any questions? Well, first right. of all, fantastic questions. job. Tammy. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. I'm going to unshare. How do I do that? This? Yeah. So. And uh, I particularly liked your thing about the Kirtlands um, and the no, the way they increased the habitat. And how did they prevent cowbird predation? Uh, by catching them, trapping them. They they trapped the cowbirds, and and uh, I, I assume they had permits to either move them and or dispose of them because they were predating. So they uh, they. They got rid of them that way. They they trapped them. It's a it's a, a good book. The Scott Widensall's book is is a fabulous book. It's a little depressing, but um, the chapter on the Kirtlands is is excellent. Good. Yeah, we have Scott. So one of the questions we had are what are the three warblers that bob their tail? If you want to review that. Oh, the three that bob their tail, the palm. Um, the Kirtlands and the, um, the prairie, there's actually more than three because the, <laughs> the, the water thrushes, I, I should change that. The water thrushes bob their tail too. Kind of. They kind of bob their whole. They kind of sashay. Yeah. That's kind of a tail bobber. It's a yes. little yes. rear bobber. So, Yeah. And um, the other, also, the, there was a question, where was that Connecticut warbler banded? On uh, South Bass Island in, um, uh, on Lake Erie. And where that was in the spring? The, that was in the fall. The one that, oh, that I had a picture where we were holding it, that was in the fall, September. Yeah. They band them in the spring and the fall. They do banding. Uh, we do banding as part of Road Scholar and then BSBO, the Black Swamp Bird Observatory band fall and spring as well. Mm -hmm. So they they have several people that are banding uh, spring and fall. And then Saul wanted, I, I might have you clarify Saul. Can you speak about the actual place? Now, there's a lot of places up there. Are you just talking about McGee Marsh or? Well, there's a number of really good marshes in this whole region. McGee Marsh is the big one. Um, yes. It's a state wildlife, uh, Division of Wildlife managed property. It's this, like I said, it's a beach ridge uh, along the edge of the lake that it goes all the way up to the lake there's there's marsh and then there's this mile long boardwalk that goes through uh this ridge that had and has some huge cottonwood and big trees where and that's where the birds all well they they're all over but that's a, a really good spot to find them um West of McGee is Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. There's an auto drive there that you can do that takes you through the marsh and, and open water and, and thick areas. Um, there's an area called Metzger Marsh that's also state run that you can drive along that takes you out to the lake. There's a Metro Park, uh, Toledo Metro Park called Howard Marsh that has two separate areas. There's, there's just lots of protected east of, of um, um, McGee is Cedar, uh, Navarre Marsh, that's, that's where they ban, that's closed. But there's Cedar Point National Wildlife Refuge is there. Um, Maumee Bay State Park is there with a boardwalk and there's just all kinds of open, um, and, and protected area in that region, and which makes ideal for, for birding and, and migrants to stop in and fatten up before they head north to the breeding territories. He also wanted to know, are there plenty of motels within an hour of McGee Marsh? Um, depends on when you go. 
<laughs> how much space there is. There are motels in Port Clinton, which is on the east east of McGee. There are hotels in uh, the Toledo area coming coming towards McGee. Um, just go to, and there's also uh, bed and breakfasts and things like that. You just have to to Google state uh, Maumee Bay State Park has a big lodge with cottages and cabins. That's where yep. the biggest week is is based out of um, Maumee Bay State Park. There, uh, where their vendors are and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he said, does it get crowded? Yes. I think yes. particularly if you go during the biggest week. The biggest week is about a 10 day festival that they've held up there now, I think going on 15 years. Um, it brings a lot of money to the to the area, to the community, a lot of attention to the to the importance of this area for for bird preservation, bird migration. Um, but it's it's busy now. There are a lot of places that you can go. So um, if it was just one park, it would be a madhouse. But since there are several, they, they have day trips that they go all over the place. If you go to the festival, um, um, and if it's busy one morning, go somewhere else or come back after, after dinner is a good time to go on the boardwalk because a lot of people are shot and they've already gone back to their hotels and it opens up and you can see that you know the birds might have taken a little snooze during the noonish hour early afternoon but then they're back out foraging again at night in the e late afternoon so um there's always somewhere you can find up there to to bird and and you're either with people or you're you're not so um uh -huh. Lots of possibilities, Susan. You could you could speak on this too. Yeah, You've and been there a few times. Yeah, yeah I've been there for a few times. So even sometimes though it's busy, if it's a hot day, sometimes it's worth the crowds. You know. Oh yeah, the crowd kind of kinda lets you know where the exciting thing does. Are. Yeah, if you see you a see big crowd of people on the boardwalk, crowd. you go up there and they they'll tell you, oh, we've got whatever. This, and we have that. They, and they have a uh, they have a chart in the there's a tent at the entrance to the boardwalk that ODNR manages and they'll have a, a sign or a, a list up based on you know what is seen that day and where and there are numbers along the boardwalk sometimes you want to yeah. go to number spot number 10 because that's where the screech owl is or or whatnot or that there's a Kirtland's warbler out on the estuary trail there's lots of different places and usually if somebody finds something rare word travels path fast yeah up and down the boardwalk and you see people making a beeline for wherever this sighting has occurred so yeah yeah and then that board is only up during the busy biggest week right right the sightings board is only up during that specific week so but it's still good right there's and, a lot of good a lot of good information on the website for BSBO on migration, what species other than other than warblers mm -hmm. that come through when and um, it's just a wealth of wealth of information. Yeah, and there are a lot of other like I think last year there was a Virginia rail that nested right off the boardwalk, and right. I came right. later and the little black cotton balls were all running around, so it was very cute. Right. Um, I think there was a woodcock that also nested. There's right? usually a woodcock that's nesting, nesting somewhere. It's it's really difficult to find, but they'll they display in the evening at um, Maumee Bay State Park, which is kind of cool. Uh, if you're camping or staying at the at the lodge, you can wander around and find them doing their aerial displays. Uh, yeah. So and he also are, said that I understand that this year tripods are no longer allowed. And I think it was a been a couple years, hasn't it? Do right. I, the tripods aren't allowed on the boardwalk. Yeah. You can still take your cameras, but as long as you don't have a tripod, um, it's just, it's what, six, eight feet wide. Yeah. And yeah. when there's a lot of people, it's difficult to get things maybe a yeah. monopod would work but a tripod no yeah. yeah 
And I think sometimes if they have a um, prothonotary with a nest that's close, they may actually even block up a little part. Right. Uh, there, it becomes even narrower at that section. There was a prothonotary last year that had a nest in the, one of the poles on the railing poles on the boardwalk. And so they kind of had you go around it because it was coming in and out through this hole and just, and the males were singing and you just, you could peek through the little crack and see it in there. But yeah, they had, they had that slightly boarded off. We also have a, a one or two active eagles nests right along the boardwalk. So depending on if they're successful, some of that, you know, some of the parking lot might be boarded off or yeah. flagged off. And I think, did they flag off part of that parking lot for Fox last year too? Did we had Fox, a Fox den there last year. Fox yep. nest, yep. a part of the. Yep. <laughs> Just weave your way through everything that's. That's right. Top. That's right. And we, <laughs> one year we had woodcocks nesting in the middle of the parking lot in the grassy berm area, and that was boarded off, but you could get up to it and see where they were on the nest. So the, you just never know what you're going to, what they'll find or what you'll find. And mm -hmm. yeah. Very fun. Yeah. It's a very fun area. It is. It is. And if it's slow and one, you can go see a lot of birds do nest there up in that area that we think are exciting. Like, you know, we may not be as excited about Northern Prulas because we have a lot of them here, but, you know, we can go up and people in Ohio are not excited about Baltimore Orioles because they have them all over the place. They're all over the Oh, and they're saying they're up there a lot. Yeah. yeah lots of Baltimore lot of Orioles, that. lots of warbling yeah. vireos. Um, yeah, tree swallows galore. The one of the neat things about this point for migration is that we get blue jays that fly parallel to the lake shore and you so you'll be standing in the parking lot at McGee and you'll just see lines of blue jays flying through and and some of our crowd will say well they're just blue jays well yeah they're just blue jays but there's like 50 of them that just flew by and here comes another 50 and it's just uh -huh. crazy they a lot of the birds um will come up to the lake they'll fly up to the lake and they don't like during the day, they don't fly over the lake. They'll fly along the edge of the lake and then cross, you know, they'll go towards Detroit and they'll go up that way. And that's what these blue jays are doing. They've come to the lake and said, oh, I'm not going to fly over top. So they fly along the edge of the, the coast and work their way west till they can head, head north again. All right. Very good. And we a lot of people have, we have a small talk. population of, of American white pelicans that are that you can find in Ottawa, which is kind of cool. That that nest that are now nesting. We have trumpeter swans that nest there. Um, yeah, lots of lots of cool Fun. species. Yellow-headed blackbirds, which are also not warblers, at one of the parks, right? We do. We have a we have some yellow-headed blackbirds at Howard Marsh. I don't know if they've nested, but they've shown up the last few years. Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky, they're feeding right alongside of the parking lot and you don't even have to get out of your car. Yeah, they look great. Walking along the dandelions there. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right, very good. Okay, uh, great yep. job. Hope Thanks, the Sally. We will. This year. We'll be doing the boardwalk this year. <laughs> All right, very good. All right, everybody. Okay, thank you. Everybody go, but, and thank you again, Tammy. It really was absolutely good. not a problem. All right. I and hope your I hope your trip fills up. Yeah. Yes. And uh yes, you're welcome back anytime on another topic. You're one of our most yeah. popular speakers. Oh. <laughs> I'll have to put another one together for that. Right. <laughs> you, you've extended all my PowerPoints right now. So oh. And then again, this, this, we are going to post this on our YouTube channel. So um, if you want to kind of review your warblers, you know, before spring is always good to take a look. Uh, you can find it on our YouTube channel. All so. right. Well, we'll say good night. Thank you. Very right. good.